and also to Saddleback Hong Kong, Saddleback Buenos Aires, Saddleback Berlin, Saddleback Manila, Saddleback Moscow, and for those of you who are joining us online. If you take out your message notes inside your program, every date in history is actually dated, including your birth date, is dated in relationship to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every time you write a date, you're using Jesus as the focal point. When we say 2014, 2015, 2016, from what? From the birth and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Even atheists refer to Jesus every single time they write down a date. Now the resurrection of Jesus accomplished a lot of different things. Of course, it split history into AD and BC. But the first thing that it did is it, is it validated Jesus' identity. It proved that he was who he claimed to be. Throughout history, lots of people have claimed to be God. Lots of people have claimed to be God. But Jesus said, I'm gonna prove it by letting them put me to death, I'm gonna die on the cross, and then I'm gonna come back three days later, alive, and I'm gonna walk around you know, Jerusalem for another 40 days. Can you imagine walking down the street and you put him on the cross and you go, he's back. That'd be kind of strange, you know? Uh, Jesus also proved, by the resurrection, that there is life after death. The death is not the end of the uh, story. But what I want us to look at this weekend is the fact that Jesus gave us a model in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. He gave us a model of how to handle pain in life. The Bible says this. You say, where does it say that? In the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 says this. God has called you to endure suffering. In other words, to go through tough times. Because Christ suffered for you. And, he says, he left you an example so that you could follow in his footsteps. In other words, through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, he modeled what you should do in the worst days of your life. When you go through the tragedies, the terrible pain circumstances, the days of doubt and depression and despair, he says you need to follow the model of what Jesus did when he suffered. Now let me explain. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection happened over three days. Friday was the day of pain and suffering and agony. Saturday was the day of loss and grief and confusion and misery. Sunday was the day of joy, celebration, and victory. Now, here's the thing. In your life, you're going to go through all three of those days over and over and over again. Some of you right now are in a day of pain. Some of you are right now in a day of confusion and doubt. You say, I have the slightest idea what I'm supposed to do next with my life. Hopefully, you'll get to the day of joy. But you're often going to go through these three days. And when you do, you're going to ask three fundamental questions. What do I do in my days of pain? How do I get through my days of doubt and confusion. How do I get to my days of victory? And that's what we're gonna look at today. Now, I hate to tell you this, but you need this message. You may not be in a problem right now, but you will have tragedy, you will have loss, major loss, in your life at some point. And so if in any week you need to take notes, this is the week. Because I'm gonna teach you what Jesus did in the worst days of his life so you can know what to do in the worst days of your life. And you don't know when they're gonna happen. Last Easter, I had no idea what was about to happen five days later. On Easter, I spoke and taught at, I don't know how many services, about 50, 55,000 people came to Saddleback Church and all of our campuses. And it was a great, wonderful day. Many people gave their lives to Christ. I had no idea on that Easter that five days later would be the worst day of my life. And on that day, my 27-year-old son, who had struggled his entire life with mental illness, would take his life. It was the worst day of my life, and this last year was the worst year of my life. And I went through the Saturdays and the Sundays over and over and over again, the days of pain and the days of confusion, the days of pain and the days of loss, the days of suffering and the days of grief, over and over. What I'm gonna teach you this weekend are the things that I learned from the Easter story that you can use in your own life. Because many, many times over the past 365 days, I've been asked, how are you getting through this? How are you handling the loss of a child? in such a severe way. How are you getting on through your grief? And every time I would say, I'm looking at the example of Jesus. The answer is Easter. I'm just following the model he did. So let's look at the three days, the last three days of Jesus' life before he died and was resurrected as a model for how you can go through the toughest days in your life. We begin with the day of pain. Friday was the day of pain. And Jesus experienced pain at the ultimate level, let me explain. First, he experienced physical pain. The Bible tells us that he was beaten. The Bible tells us that he was whipped, that he was wounded, that he was spit on, that he was slapped, that they plucked out his beard just to be mean, that they stuck a crown of thorns down into his skull, 
that he was scourged. And what a scourging is is different than just a whipping. It's a long uh, a whip with a kind of a cat of nine tails at the end of it. And they would tie little bits of bone, rock, and glass at the end so that every time they would whip you, it would tear at your, at your back. So nine times 40 stripes, you can figure the number of wounds that were on Jesus' back before he went to the cross. And then they took him, and without sleep, without food, without water, he's been up all night, and they take and they nail him to a cross, which is one of the worst forms of torture you can imagine. I don't have time to get into it, uh, the, the explanation of it, but the death of crucifixion is death by suffocation. And that's why they would often break the bones uh, uh, of, uh, of your legs so you couldn't stand up anymore and you couldn't breathe anymore. Jesus experienced the ultimate in physical pain, but he also experienced the ultimate in emotional pain and, and psychological pain, because the death on the cross was a death by humiliation. How'd you like to be stripped naked and nailed like this and then let people watch you die? It was a death of humiliation, a death of degradation, a, a death of shame. He, he went through the pain of rejection. He went through the pain of betrayal. And many of you know the pain that, that that causes. He experienced that. But then there was another level of pain that none of us have ever experienced to his degree, and that is spiritual pain. Because Jesus died on the cross for all the sins of mankind, which means he took the guilt of every evil crime and of every ugly sin throughout history, all that guilt on him at one point. And so he takes, you know how bad you feel if you feel guilty over one thing? How would you like to carry the guilt of every murder, every rape, every child molestation, the Holocaust, every uh, um, uh, genocide, every evil thing, every inhumanity to man? He took all of that guilt on himself. And he went through the hell of separation from God when he cries out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so we have never experienced that kind of intense physical, mental, and spiritual pain combined. I want you to just watch a snippet, and I actually had to sanitize it because we have children in the service. Just a little bit of the pain that Jesus went through, and then I want to explain how he understands your pain. Watch this. Wake up and keep awake. The time has come. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I must pray. Father, I know it must be if you will it. Father, if you will it. Your will is mine. One thing you can be certain about Jesus is this, he understands pain. And he understands every pain you go through and he sympathizes with it. Let me show you a couple of verses from the Bible up here on the screen. The Bible says in Hebrews four, Jesus understands our weaknesses for he faced all the same trials and temptations we do, yet he never sinned. And the Bible says in Hebrews two, since Jesus went through suffering and temptation, he knows what it's like when we suffer and are tempted. And here's the key, he is able to help us. He knows the pattern, the pathway, and he has the power to get through the Fridays and the Saturdays, the days of pain and the days of confusion in your life. So what do you do in your days of pain? You do the two things that Jesus did on the last day of his life. You need to write these down. The two things that Jesus did and he modeled for us to do. You follow his example. Number one, this may surprise you, reach out to friends. That's the first thing Jesus did. Their presence can be helpful in your life in sharing your pain. On the night that Jesus knew he was gonna be arrested, tortured, and executed, the last thing he did on planet Earth was gather his closest friends together and say, I need you guys to just hang out with me. 
I don't need any sermons, I don't need any speeches, I don't need any advice, I just need you to be with me. This is the ministry of presence. And he says, I need to go pray. And he goes to his favorite prayer spot. It was called the Garden of Gethsemane. Now Gethsemane is an olive grove on the Mount of Olives. And so it would really, you could call it an olive garden, but that's a restaurant, so we'll just call it, a, we'll call it a, a grove of olives. And this is where Jesus regularly went to pray. And so he takes his 11 closest guys. Judas has died. These people spent three and a half years with him. They're his most intimate friends. And he says, in my day of deepest need, in my hour of greatest pain, I just need my friends to hang out with me. Notice what the Bible said, Matthew chapter 26. Jesus took his disciples with him to Gethsemane. And he said, stay here with me. Just circle that, stay here with me. I just need you to be present with me while I pray. And then he took Peter and James and John a little further. And he was filled with anguish and deep distress, because he knows what's coming. And he said to them, my heart is so overwhelmed and crushed with sorrow that I feel like I'm dying. Just sit here and just watch with me. And then Jesus took a few more steps and he fell to the ground and he prayed. Now that passage in the Bible tells us two startling facts. Even the Son of God need friends in the middle of pain. Even Jesus needed friends to be around him. You see, this is the exact opposite of what you normally do. When you are in pain, you typically isolate yourself. You back out of relationships. When you are in physical pain, when you're in chronic pain, when you are in emotional pain, when you're in mental pain, when you've had a failure, when you have an enormous hurt, when you're embarrassed or ashamed or whatever it is, you typically begin to isolate. That's dumb. It is a mistake to pull back from your friends in your pain. God never meant for you to go through life on your own. He meant for them to share your pain with you, and he meant for you to share their pain when they are in pain. Don't isolate. The other thing that's startling about this is how open and how gut level honest and how authentic Jesus is about his emotional condition. He doesn't sugarcoat it. They said, how you doing? I'm doing fine. How you doing? Oh, I have faith. No, he tells them exactly how he feels. And he says, my heart is so overwhelmed and so crushed with sorrow. I feel like I'm dying. Have you ever been that gut level honest with anybody? Or have you just held it all in and sucked it up and pretended like things were good and said, oh, I'm fine, when it wasn't fine, you're going through enormous pain. You see, God says, I don't want you to repress your pain, I don't want you to suppress your pain, I want you to express your pain to your friends, and I want you to confess your pain to me. You gotta get it out. Let me show you a verse here on the screen. Galatians 6, 2 says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? Love your neighbor as yourself. And the Bible says that I am commanded by God to be there for you when you're in pain. And you are commanded to be there for me when I'm in pain. We are to carry each other's burdens and that way the load is halved. You never were meant to go through life on your own. Last Friday, I met with a friend of mine for a discussion. He happened to be out here on the uh, West Coast. He's in his late 70s, early 80s. He's a very famous person. In fact, he won the Nobel Peace Prize. His name is Elie Wiesel. Elie Wiesel has written 57 books. And for his entire life, since World War II, he's been an international uh, ambassador for peace and reconciliation all around the world. But he's best known for the fact that he survived the Nazi death camps in World War II. He was at Buchenwald. In fact, there's a famous picture. You've seen this picture before. Most people don't know. I circled it. That's Elie Wiesel there in that famous picture on that bunk at the back. And he was there in Buchenwald, and he saw the horrendous torture and, and extermination of family and friends in six million Jews being killed in the Holocaust. And last Friday, as I was meeting with my friend, I said, Ellie, how did you get through the darkest days of your pain? And he said, God and friends. The very two things that Jesus looked to when he was in the darkest last day of his life. And the very two things God wants you to turn to when you are in pain. First, you reach out to your friends. I stand before you and tell you honestly, I probably wouldn't be standing for you today if it wasn't for my small group. My small group of eight people, four women, four men, it's four couples, we've been together now about 11 years. We have been through every kind of problem you could imagine. And I have been there for them in their pain, and this last year they showed up in my life, and Kay's life, and in Amy and Tommy, and Josh and Jamie, they're just supporting our family any way that they could. They spent the night at, at, at our house. They've brought food, they've cared, they have been there. In the middle of the night I could call them. And as I was going through this day of Friday, over and over and over, they were there when I needed them. If you're not in a small group, I actually worry about you as your pastor, because you don't have the safety net that's gonna carry you when, you when the rogue wind comes along in life. Who's gonna help you out when you have the tragedy? Who's gonna be there for you? 
We talk about this so much because Saddleback is the only church in America where we have more people in small groups on a weekly basis meeting in homes than come on the weekend. We have about 40,000 people in small groups in 8,200 small groups that go from Santa Monica to San Diego. We have small groups in every city. There's no excuse for you to not be in a group. And I would encourage you to, to set, make a decision today on this Easter, I'm gonna get in a small group before the crisis comes because it is inevitably coming. Nobody could have told me what was gonna happen last Easter. I just imagined things were going great. I had no idea the wall I was gonna hit five days later. You don't know when you're gonna hit the wall. So you start by reaching out to friends just like Jesus did. Now, friends are essential. But friends can't be with you there all the time. God can, but friends can't. Friends can be there and understand the depth of your pain, but they can't understand the real depth of your pain like God can. And friends have other things they have to do, and friends get tired. God never gets tired. The fact is, Jesus' friends in the Garden of Gethsemane, that night in his hour of deepest need, they fell asleep. Now, I'm not gonna put them down for that. I'm really not. In the first place, they showed up. They were there. In the second place, I have fallen asleep countless times in my small group and snort all the way, and my group loves me no matter what, I've had a real tough day, so I give you permission to fall asleep in your small group. It's better to go to your group and go to sleep than stay home and watch television. But at least they showed up, okay? But friends cannot be there all the time, but God never gets tired. So the second thing you need to do when you're in the Fridays of life, the days of pain, is you reach out to God. You don't just reach out to your friends, you also reach out to God. And how do you do that? You do it by praying. This is the other thing that Jesus did right before he faced the worst pain of his life. He went and prayed. The Bible says this in Mark chapter 14. Jesus fell face down on the ground. Friends, I can't tell you the number of times I've done that this last year in pain and in grief. He fell face down on the ground and prayed that if possible, he would not have to suffer the pain ahead of him. He prayed, Abba, Father. Now, Abba is the Aramaic word for daddy. It's also a Swedish rock group, but that's not what we're talking about here. He's saying, Abba, Abba is the first word every little Middle Eastern child learns before any other word. It's Abba, Papa, Dada. It's e any baby can learn to say Abba, Abba, Abba. It means Daddy. And Jesus is saying, when you are in your worst day of pain and you need to talk to God about it, you don't use fancy language. You don't say, oh, thou most righteous, justice, omnipotent creator of the universe, who art, and you have all of these great theological terms. No, you just go, Daddy, help. That's what you do. You come to God and say, Daddy, help me, because your heavenly Father loves you. And so Jesus prays, Abba, Daddy, Father. And here's what he prays. I know you can do all things, and I don't wanna to have to drink this cup of suffering. Nevertheless, I want your will, not mine, to be done. Now listen closely. This is a pattern. Jesus prayed three things in his day of deepest pain. And when you are in pain, these are the three things you need to pray to when you're praying to God, when your heart is breaking and you don't know which way to turn. Three things Jesus prayed. I call this the Gethsemane prayer. It is a model of how to pray in pain. First, you affirm God's power. And here's what you pray. God, I know you can do anything. You write that down. God, I know you can do anything. You know, I know you can take away this pain. You, you created the universe. If you created the universe, you can do anything. I know you can do anything. You affirm God's power. Second, you express your desire. And you say, I don't want this pain. You say, is it okay to complain to God? Of course it's okay to plain, complain to God. David did it all the time in the book of Psalms. They're called Psalms of Lament. It's okay to say, God, this sucks. I don't like this. This stinks. This is terrible. I don't like this pain I'm going through right now. That's okay to do that. Jesus did it. If it's okay for Jesus to do it, it's certainly okay for you to do it. And he said, God, I don't like the pain I'm in right now. I know you can change it. I know you're all powerful, and I don't like the pain. But then the third thing you do is you offer your trust, and you say, but I want your will, not mine. So God, if this is not your will, I don't want it. I want your will, not mine. I know you love me. I know you know what's best for me. I know what you know what will make me happy more than I do. And I know, God, that you're in control, and there's no way that you don't love me. So I want your will, not mine. This past year, any time a wave of grief or loss or depression or fear or confusion, I would pray the Gethsemane prayer. I, this prayer, I may have prayed it a thousand times this last year. God, I know you can do anything, and I don't like this pain. But God, I want your will, not mine. Now as Jesus finished praying, soldiers show up, they arrest him, they take him through six phony, fake, mock trials, all of them illegal, three Jewish, three Roman trials, they were all at night, which they were all illegal, they were just shams. Uh, then they torture him through all kinds of torture, and then they nail him to a cross, and he dies. And they put him in the ground. And now we come to the second day, which are the Saturdays of life. The Fridays are the days of pain and suffering. The Saturdays are the days of doubt and confusion. 
Imagine how the disciples felt when they saw the Messiah, the Son of God, crucified by the Romans, taken down and put in a tomb, and the tomb is sealed. They're all going, what happened? And they're thinking, we know Jesus could have come down off that cross at any point, because we saw him do all the miracles for the last three and a half years. We saw him heal the sick. We saw him give sight to the blind. We saw him raise the dead. We saw him walk on water. We saw him calm the storms and control the weather. I mean, we saw him do every, God can, if he created the universe, God can do anything he wants to in the universe. God could have come down off that cross, Jesus could have come off that cross at any moment. It was not nails that held Jesus to the cross, it was love. It was his love for you. It's what he came to do. He said, for this cause, I came into the world. Jesus was not a martyr. Martyrs are often killed, not at their will, but somebody just kills them because they're doing the right thing, not because they will to do it. Jesus voluntarily sacrificed himself. He said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down and I have the right to take it back. He was not a martyr. He was on a mission. And the mission was to pay for all the sins of the world. But imagine the confusion. There's profound grief. They see this Messiah who's supposed to overthrow the Roman Empire and liberate Israel, and now the Romans have killed him and he's dead in the grave. Huh? What happened? That's the massive day of confusion. That's the Saturdays of life. When you go, why did that happen? Profound grief, great loss, disillusionment doubt. I, I, I just think of all the emotions they probably felt on Saturday. Uh, they probably felt regret. I imagine that the disciples did a, a pretty good amount of what ifing on Saturday. What if we had stopped Judas from leaving the Last Supper? Maybe we could have prevented this. What if we'd done that? And they probably had a lot of self-recrimination. They said, you know, we all walked away from Jesus. Once he was arrested, the Bible says they all scattered. We, we wimped out. We went AWOL. We left him. We deserted him. We abandoned him. They're all embarrassed. Peter goes, Lord, I'll never deny you. And that night denies him three times. There's a lot of self-recrimination going on. Then there's probably some fear mixed in there going, hey, wait a minute. They killed Jesus. They're coming after us next. Are the Romans going to come after us now? I mean, we're the next of kin. I mean, we're, the, we're his closest followers. They killed Jesus. They're going to kill us. So they're afraid. And then, of course, there's confusion. What in the world do we do now? When you're in that Saturday of life, you're in limbo. You've been there many times. You went out and you, you accepted a new job or you started a new business and you had so much hope that it was gonna be so good and so great and maybe even felt like God led you to start that business or go to that job and then it didn't work out and you get fired or the, the company goes belly up and you go bankrupt and you go, now what am I supposed to do? Or, or you, you go into a marriage with the greatest of hopes thinking this is gonna be heaven on earth and then the marriage fails and it falls apart and you go, okay, what's my identity now? What do I do now? There are a thousand ways you go through the Saturdays of life. The days of doubt, the days of confusion, the days of loss and grief. Now Jesus had warned them that this was gonna happen. Let me show you some verses, look up here on the screen. The Bible says in Matthew 26, that very night, the night he was arrested and, and killed, it said, then Jesus told them, before the night's over, you're gonna fall to pieces because of what happens to me. In fact, look at this next verse. The Bible tells us that that night Jesus said, all of you will desert me, Jesus told them. For the scripture says, I'll strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And that's exactly what happened. Every one of the disciples went A-W-O-L, absent without leave. They, they all deserted, they all demanded. Look at this verse. The Bible says, at that point when Jesus was arrested, all the disciples abandoned Jesus and ran away. Every single one of them ran away. Now let me ask you a very pointed personal question. Have you ever deserted God out of pain? Maybe you were praying for something to happen and it didn't happen that way, so you walked away from church many years ago. Or, or, or maybe, maybe you, you thought it should happen this way and it ended up being a massive disappointment and you lost your faith and you walked away or you ran away from God. Have you ever let pain move you away from God instead of to God? It's time to come home. It's, it's time to come back home. You know, this past year, when Kay and I were going through all this grief and pain and we were going back and forth between Fridays and Saturdays, days of pain, days of confusion, days of agony, days of mystery, days of loss and days of grief. And, and uh, we decided for six months we would do no interviews. And finally, after about six months, I said, okay, we'll do one interview. And I chose CNN because I knew that that one would be shown all around the world and then we wouldn't have to do all the other ones. <laughs> and I remember in that one hour interview, many of you saw that, they, they played it nine times on CNN. And, and one of the questions that Piers Morgan asked me was this, Rick, in your deepest depth of despair and depression and grief and loss after Matthew's suicide, did you ever doubt God's existence? And I looked at Pierce, and I could honestly say, 
No, I, I never doubted God's existence. I know God exists and I know he loves me. But I did doubt his wisdom. And I did doubt his timing and his plan. Let me give you an, an example of this. My kids have never doubted that they had a father. They know they have a father. They've never doubted that I was their father. They, they knew that I, they've never doubted that I was their father and my kids have never ever doubted that I love them. They know that I love them. But they have often doubted my wisdom. <laughs> Does dad really know what he's doing right now? I mean, is he really that confident? I mean, maybe he's making the wrong decision right now. And they didn't doubt that I existed, that I loved them. They just doubted my wisdom. That's okay in the day of chaos and in the day of conflict and in the day of, conference, uh, of confusion. And sometimes you go through that. David does this all through the book of Psalms. And he says, you know, I, I don't know what's going on in my life. How do I now get through the days of confusion and loss? I want you to write this down. You need to remember the promises of God. You need to remember the promises of God. Never doubt in the dark what God has shown you in the light. And when you're going through those days, and you're gonna go through them many times in life, when you can't put one foot in front of the other, and you don't even know, it's so dark, you can't even see ahead of you one foot. You haven't the slightest idea what to do next with your life. Everything's just kinda turned to ashes, it's thrown up in the air, all of the plans have gone down the toilet, and you don't even know what to do. And when you are in that situation, you're in the Saturday of life. You're in the day of confusion. You never doubt in the dark what God has told you in the light, and you never doubt his promises. Right before Jesus was crucified, he gave his disciples a huge promise to hang on to in the dark days of Saturday. Let me show you to you, it's up here on the screen. John chapter 16. Jesus said, here's what's going to happen. Now this is, he's telling them this that very night that he's gonna be arrested. Jesus said, here's what's gonna happen. Soon I'll be gone and you'll be without me. But after a while, you'll see me again. He's predicting his resurrection. He knows what's gonna happen, they don't. You'll see me again. He says, you will weep and you will mourn and you will grieve but your grief will eventually turn into joy. And then he says this, it will be like a woman going through labor pains. When her child is finally born, her anguish, that labor pain, turns to joy because the new life wipes out the memory of the pain. And then he says, in the same way, you'll go through sorrow now, but I'll be back. <laughs> 2,000 years before Arnold said it, Jesus said it. Okay, Arnold just ripped it off, okay? He said, I'll be back, I'll be back, and you will rejoice. And I love this part, and no one will be able to rob you of that joy. All right, because he said, when I come back, you're gonna be fearless, because you know that I can handle it. It was all planned, it was all part of the grand scheme. You can't see it in the days of pain, and you can't see it in the days of confusion. But it's all part of the plan, and it's a good plan. And when, that come, when you see that plan, you will rejoice in ways nobody ever imagined. And nobody can tell that, tear that joy away from you. Now, I don't know what you're going through right now, but I will tell you this. You need to become a promise person. What's a promise person? You need to know and claim the promises of God. Now, in this book, the Bible, there are over 7,000 promises of God to you. Did you know that? You don't even know them. And if you don't even know them, you can't claim them. And if you can't claim them, they're like checks that have been sent to you and they're piling up in your mailbox and you can't even use them. How do you know when you don't know the promises of God? Oh, it's real simple. There's a warning sign and it's real common. When you don't know the promises of God, you know what you do? It's called worry. Are any of you familiar with this word? <laughs> because when you don't know what God is guaranteed to take care of in your life, you act like it all depends on you. And then you worry, and you stress out, and you have panic attacks, and you get upset, and you get anxious, and you get uh, uh, over, over pressured, pressured and stressed out in every kind of way. And you're, and you're worried because you don't know what's covered in the owner's manual. A couple weeks ago, I had um, surgery on, on uh, one of my feet. And uh, I didn't know if the surgery was gonna cover, be covered by my insurance or not. So you look it up on the insurance, and you go, oh, well, yeah, this kind of surgery is actually covered. Once you know what's covered in the policy, what do you do about it? You keep worrying? No, you forget it. You forget it. The reason why you're worrying is you don't know what's covered in the policy for you. There are 7,000 promises. And the way you get through the days of confusion and doubt is you hang on to the promises of God. I said in the dark, you never doubt what God's told you in life. What do we know about God in the light? Well, we know that God sees everything you go through. We know that God cares about everything you go through. We know that God grieves when you hurt. 
The only reason you're able to have sorrow and grief is because you're made in God's image and God grieves. God sorrows. The Bible tells us that God weeps. And when God sees in, inhumanity done by humans to other humans, God weeps because he doesn't like it. And he's sorrowful by the way people treat each other. 